Hello everybody, I am Sam Morgan, the Chief Executive and Company Secretary of the Third Age Trust. I'll be taking you through the introduction to today's AGM before passing over to Ian McKenna, Chair of the Board of Trustees, who will be chairing our annual general meeting today. Today, U3As are joining us remotely from all over the United Kingdom to hear the debate and vote on business of the day. And we'll also have members joining us here in person at Chesford Grange. We've all been through our very second, our very challenging second year of the pandemic. And together we've got through it. The Third Age Trust includes us all. Every member of every U3A, every U3A committee, every volunteer for the Trust, every staff member and of course the Board of Trustees. And everyone has contributed to keeping the U3A movement and the U3A community strong and vibrant and ready to face the future. We've taken steps today to make this meeting accessible to as many members as possible, whilst also respecting the government guidelines on social distancing and public gatherings. I'm pleased to be able to extend a warm welcome to all of you who are participating online through our virtual meeting platform and those of you here at Chesford Grange. I would just like to take a moment before I continue to take you through the, uh, the, the fire evacuation process. There are no fire evacuation tests planned today. So if the fire alarm goes off, please evacuate. Please go through the reception, turn to the right, and go to the events centre car park and assemble by the green colour sign fire assembly point. If you evacuate through the Kenilworth bar, turn left. There are accessible toilets in the Kenilworth bar um, by, by going through the Kenilworth bar and into the Grange room. And there is a loop system for those of you that require it. I would now just like to take a few moments to explain the voting procedure we, that you will use today. For those attending online, the voting options will appear on your screen when the poll is declared open. So to exercise your vote at the appropriate time, you will need to use the voting icon that will appear on the navigation bar and click the desired voting choice to vote. You may click another choice to override your previous vote or press cancel to cancel your vote. And you can do that as many times as you wish up until the close of the poll. Your vote will have been submitted when the voting icon changes colour, having selected it, and a vote received message appears. There is no final submit button as the voting is, line, is live. If any person at the meeting online is having any difficulties using the platform, there is a user guide that has been prepared that you can use to access through the platform on the information tab, and that should address any questions you have. Please note that only registered voting delegates will be able to vote or ask questions in the AGM. You will have a very clear prompt to warn of the close of voting in any resolution. For those of you in the room here today, your electronic voting keypad will activate when the poll is declared open. Press one to vote for, two to vote against, or three to abstain. Again, you can change your vote by simply pressing the number corresponding to your new voting selection, and this will override your previous vote. And if you wish to cancel your vote, please press the X button. If anyone in the room needs assistance, please just raise your hand. At various points during the meeting, uh, voting delegates joining us remotely will be able to submit questions or comments depending on the item via the messaging icon located in the navigation bar at the bottom of your screen if viewing from a phone or the top of your screen if viewing from a laptop. 
Type your message into the box and click the arrow button to the right hand side of the message box. Lumi will make any incoming comments visible on screen to the presenters and the company secretary. They will not be visible to online attendees. The chair of the section of the meeting will read or summarise the points and either answer the questions if relevant or pass them over to the relevant presenter. For those of you in the room, please can you raise your hand and the chair will indicate to you when it's your turn to speak. Please note that for people who are attending online, there is a short delay of 20 seconds when we come to proposing, seconding and voting online. So Ian will tell you at the appropriate time when the voting is ready to close. According to our attendance report, we have a quorum of 339 U3As taking part. So I have pleasure in declaring the meeting open. I will take you through the remaining voting statistics. 221 U3As with voting delegates are present at the AGM, either online or present here in the room. 264 voting delegates hold 494 votes and that equates to 22% of the total of U3As carrying 17% of the possible votes. In terms of proxies, 118 U3As are proxying 225 votes to the company secretary. No U3As proxied votes to other U3As. So in total, we have 339 U3As with 719 votes engaging in the vote process, 33% of U3As carrying 37% of the available votes. The minutes will, will detail the total votes available and actually cast and will be broken down by region or nation. I will now hand over to Ian McKenna, Chair of the Third Age Trust, to take you through the agenda. Thank you very much, Sam, and welcome to all the members attending this AGM, those here physically in Kenilworth and those online. Without further delay, I will move to item one on the agenda, the approval of the minutes from last year's AGM. Please may I have, and I'm going to do this, but I need a proposer and a seconder, so I'm going to take a proposer each time for these various resolutions from the floor here, from the U3A that's present here, and then the seconder will be online. I've done that so that I don't confuse myself or anybody else as to the sequence. So please may I have a U3A from the floor uh, to propose the minutes. And can I have a seconder from out there in the ether uh, to, to second them. If you just... Christine Clark, Canterbury. Canterbury, thank you. Now, type, propose, or second within the textbook at the bottom of the messaging screen and then click the send button to the right of the textbook to submit. Hope this works. So we have Canterbury from the floor. And I'm going to be told who is seconding from the ether. Are they out there? <laughs> We're testing this. We may have to. Ah. Uh, Who? Sorry. Fleet and District. Right. So I can Park. confirm that Canterbury Youth Ray will propose, and Fleet and District Youth Ray will second this resolution. I now open the poll for you to cast your votes on item one on the agenda. The slide reminds you how to cast your vote votes. I will keep this open for a minute 
to give you time to get used to the voting system and vote. The poll is now open. Please vote now. As I say, we'll leave it open for a minute. You think time goes very quickly, but when you're watching this, it goes incredibly slowly. So. got a few of these to do. Right, the poll is now closed and hopefully the results will appear on the screen shortly. There's a 20 second time lag as Sam mentioned because of the uh, getting the votes in from the online U3As. Fingers crossed. Yeah, right. Good. To receive, right. Resolution one, to receive and approve the minutes of the 2020 AGM. Well, look at this. So votes for 504, votes against zero, and withheld, no reasons given, 26. Good. So I I'm pleased to declare resolution one is passed. Without further delay, I will move to item two on the agenda, the approval of the minutes from last year's extraordinary general meeting held in December. Again, please I have a proposer from the floor here and a, a, um, a, a seconder from um, the online U3As. Type propose or second within the text box at the bottom of the messaging screen and then click the send button to the right of the text box to submit. Thank you. So I'd like a a proposer from the floor, from a U3A. Oh, yes, sorry. Preston and District, thank you. Oh, your name, sorry. Tony Cheatham. Tony Cheatham. Preston and District. And the second uh, will come through, hopefully. Bridge, U3A. Boarding Bridge, yeah. Joan Miller. Thank you. So I can confirm that Preston and District U3A will propose the resolution and Fording Bridge U3A will second this resolution. So I will now open the poll for you to cast your votes on item two on the agenda. The slide remi reminds you how to cast your votes. I'm sure you all know this by Pat now. I will keep this open for a minute to give you time to get used to the voting system and vote. The poll is now open. Please vote now. And we'll watch the seconds count down. Tensions mounting, I think. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
Right, the poll is now closed and the results will appear in about 20 seconds, hopefully, on your screens. Right, well, good results, this. To re resolution two, to receive and approve the minutes of the 2020 Extraordinary General Meeting, four, 487, against zero, and withhold 43. I think a slight increase on last time. So thank you very much. I'm, so I'm pleased to declare resolution two is passed. There will be a few more opportunities to go through this voting system later on. I'm now going to move on to item three on your agenda, my chair's report. It gives me great pleasure to present my third and final annual chair's report. Members who follow football will be familiar with commentators describing a match as a game of two halves. Allow me to amend this cliché by saying that my three-year term of office has been neatly split into two halves. During the first 18 months, the Trust continued to work closely with members in the provision of a range of services, advice and support against the background of historic growth in youth 3 membership. Steady progress was also made in implementing the Trust Development Plan announced at the 2019 AGM. <clears throat> the second 18 months saw these calm waters turn very stormy. Across the movement, members, committees, Trust volunteers and the UK office staff team and of course the board members have worked tirelessly to maintain activity and remain connected. The U3A community has made great efforts to embrace the, digi the digital world in order to connect with one another while face-to-face -face meetings have not been possible. The Trust held its first virtual AGM last September and for the first time many members had access, as they do today, to an event in a way that was not possible in the past. Today's hybrid AGM continues this opportunity for members to access the work of the Trust, and I'm sure that it will be a precedent for future ones. Thank you, Julie Walter, uh, Julie, Tra Julie Tra Travers, uh, uh, <laughs> Julie Travers, um, Julie, and the team from Youth Rail Office for bringing us together in Kenilworth so efficiently. Since the pandemic reached our shores, Trust advice has been provided on the constantly changing Four Nations COVID-19 guidance and ha on how to hold virtual AGMs, how to use technology, and how to move youth ray activities online. During this long period of lockdown, the Trust team of, of staff and volunteers have provided many initiatives to keep youth rays active and alive. Brew that Richard has prepared for me. This included a range of online workshops on topics such as an introduction to Zoom on how to run hybrid meetings and use social media. This expanded workshop programme was developed, coordinated and delivered by a dedicated team of U3 volunteers. The National Learning Programme included events with a National Gallery, the British Library, David Livingstone Birthplace Trust, Southwark Cathedral, the National Trust, the Wildlife Trust, and the National Army Museum. All involved hundreds of members from across the movement, far more than would have been possible with physical meetings. A highly successful annual creative writing competition was held in partnership with Bloomsbury Publishing Company, as well as a poetry competition a fortnightly photography challenge, a weekly maths challenge, the diary project, now hosted by the very famous Mass Observation Project, which some of you remember from the Second World War, the work they did 
in um, getting people's experiences of the war documented. And this resulted in the book, In Time of Corona, which I think is still available to members now. Other online learning initiatives focused on physical activity, such as yoga and cycling, paint or draw, bird watch, cuisines of the world, and Battle of Britain stories. The Trust is currently working with U3A interest groups to pilot speaker swaps for British history and Egyptology. And I hope that these pilots will spread to other learning groups across the UK. Winter, spring and summer learning programmes all went online with sessions that delivered by members for members. Sessions are now routinely available for up to 500 members. These initiatives have been very ably overseen by Alison May, Head of Member Services in the U3A office. Supporting U3A learning is a team of 85 subject advisors who offer advice and information on diverse topics. The website learning pages now receives more than 20,000 hits a month. A dedicated team of volunteers launched U3A radio podcast to promote activity and learning across the movement. You can hear it if you go to the U3A YouTube channel. We've been very fortunate, ah, oh, good. We have been very fortunate to have Chris Winner for um, Wales chairing the Learning Committee. And this screen here shows one of her many other talents. She leads the Trust Learning Initiative in something I had no idea about until I saw this, extreme crochet and knitting. Uh, and here's an example of the, her, her crochet. Um, so the pandemic has fast-tracked the move to developing online informal learning through the Learning Hub. And relying on members' in input, the Learning Hub will be a resource for interest groups to access material produced by U3A, both U3As and external bodies. This initiative goes to the heart of the Trust's charitable objective of providing informal learning into the third age of life. As with an individual U3A, the Trust will not be immune from the impact of COVID on its finances. In his, in his Treasurer's report, Richard will highlight a windfall surplus last year due to steady income combined with a large fall in expenditure, as all meetings went online and were free of associated expenses. Members will note that the budget for the current fiscal year is showing a deficit. Expenses will remain low as many meetings will stay online, but membership subscriptions to the Trust are expected to fall by just under 20%, in line with the numbers not renewing their local U3A memberships. It is hoped that in future, membership will then revert to its historic upward trend. But the Trust will need to keep a tight control on its finances if this loss of income does not recover or falls further. Reserves are healthy now and can withstand these crosswinds in the short term. Underpinning all the work of the Trust and its committees and working groups, uh, we were, sorry, underpinning all the work of the Trust are its committees and working groups, we could not function without the volunteer support from members. Expertise gained in many fields during your working lives and your deep understanding of the U3A movement has proved invaluable. To have commercial consultants providing advice would have been far beyond the Trust's resources. A key committee is the Communications and External Affairs Committee, now chaired by Anne Keating, trustee for Scotland. SEAC, as we call it, first initiative was to launch a new U3A logo and associated publicity material last year, based on advice of an external consultant and focus groups of ordinary members. More recently, we've introduced a new logo on merchandise through our own brand centre. And you'll see some examples of the tops that uh, the office team are wearing. 
Um, so uh, it's the first time I've actually seen them. So when I get home, I'm going to order some for the walking group in Potter's Bar. Uh, with, and that's the idea, to try and use these, these uh, items of clothing to be personalized for youth 3 as so that um, they raise their profile as they do events outside in their old communities. Um, more recently, we introduced the new logo on merchandise through our brand centre. The rebrand was delivered at low cost due to members' advice, as I've mentioned, and expertise. Nine months after this rebrand, these changes appear to be widely accepted by the movement, although it is true to say a few members have written to me and expressed reservations. But in my view, it was a very timely development. The movement needs a modern image if it is, the, is to appeal to the next generation of potential members, who, in turn, will hopefully provide the committee members and interest group leaders of the future. Ocean. It's working, actually, I hope. You 3 a volunteers have worked in areas as diverse as Beacon, Site Builder, summer and winter school tutors, moderating our social media platforms, and many other roles, too numerous to mention. Nearly 350 trust volunteers ensure that this complex machine runs smoothly. By sharing your skills and expertise, the trust owes you all a great deal of gratitude. This commitment to volunteering is not just at the trust level, but throughout the movement. The contribution made by members in terms of time and talent to a vast range of volunteer roles is truly impressive. We're talking about 40,000 interest group leaders and approximately 10,000 U3A committee members across the movement. In my term, the beating heart of the movement. There are many opportunities for members to help run the trust activities. Look out for adverts in TAM and the monthly newsletter. Nowhere is there a better example of our volunteering ethos than in the U3A management system, Beacon. Beacon volunteers, led by Frank Bailey, Ripon and District U3A, provide a vital link between users and the trust on both technical and development issues. The Beac as you all know, the Beacon Upgrade project has been delayed as a result of the significant delays by the commercial supplier of the underlying contract. The Trust will regularly update Beacon users on the next stages of this upgrade. Meanwhile, the existing Beacon system will continue to provide key support to users. The Trust's wholly owned subsidiary, Third A's Trust Trading Limited, shortened to Tattle, has entered its third year under the very capable chairmanship of Clive Grace, a member of, member of Crick Howell U3A. During the year, Tattle partnered with Brand IQ to provide members with U3A publicity material and branded products, as I referred to it earlier, including clothing via our new online shop. It is expected that Tattle will provide other benefits to members in the coming months, and decisions in this regard will, of course, be taken after consultation with members and in keeping with maintaining the good reputation of the trust. So we'll only promote products that we are absolutely comfortable, are ethic ethically correct, and meet the needs of our membership. With a circulation of around a quarter of a million members, TAM is one of the biggest mass circulation magazines in the UK. Its new editor, Joanne Smith, has brought a modern look to TAM. From the letters pages, it is obvious that readers have welcomed these changes. One of the Trust's responses to the pandemic was to launch Trust U3A, following requests from members of the public for information about, their youth, about U3A as their local ones were in lockdown. Trust U3A has allowed people to experience U3A virtually across geographic barriers until they can join their local one as normal activity returns.
currently at, it has nearly 1,000 members and nearly 100 interest groups. The board is currently considering how Trust U3A can be part of a wide-ranging online learning offering to the movement. As Trust U3A develops in the future, however, it cannot replace the heart and soul of the movement, members' face-to-face -face social interaction within interest groups. I've been fortunate that Jeff Carter, co-opted to the board after serving as trustee for the East of England last year, agreed to take the chair of the Governance Committee for a third year. Over the last 12 months, the Trust has faced several complex policy issues, and Jeff's calm and reasoned approach has brought them to a successful conclusion. I can see him blushing here just in front of me. Although during the current coming year, implementation of the Trust medium-term development plan, which I referred to at the beginning of this report, it will continue. Increased emphasis will be placed on a strategic plan to address the anticipated long-term impact of COVID on the U3A movement. And Jeff uh, will make a presentation on this initiative after the AGM closes this, this morning. Running in parallel with the development of a digital strategy, which will include Beacon, to ensure that both the online services offered to U3As and the internal sources of the Trust are well placed to meet the requirements of the new digital world. Oriel Ainley, sitting next to my wife, um, past trustee for the West Midlands, has chaired the International Committee for a third year and focused the Trust international links with EFOS, the European Federation of Overseas Students. My thanks go to Sandy Rickaby, trustee for North East England, for chairing the National Research and SLP Committee. The U3, U3A High Street project is the first large-scale re national research project based on a level of digital collaboration not previously seen across the movement. It has caught the imagination of more than 500 volunteers from over 200 U3As, who, in September 2020, carried out surveys of their high streets. The results of this project will be one of the 40th anniversary flagship events next year. And we're very fortunate to have Michaela Moody, your new vice chair, leading the group of members organising this high-profile SLP. Maggie Sims of Blackburn U3A, halfway through the year, took over from Gen Jennifer Simpson from South End U3A, the oversight of the other impressive shared learning projects undertaken across the UK. Our best, best wishes go to Jennifer for her hard work for SLPs over many years, and to Maggie for taking hold of the baton and for her contribution to one of my little pet projects, the Slow Ways Walking Project. SLPs provide members with the opportunity to participate in short-term research projects with organisations such as museums, universities and art galleries. They go to the heart of our mission to continue informal learning into the third age of life, as well as very effectively raising the movement's profile. During the year, we welcome Susan Southwell of Humble Valley U3A, who succeeded Doreen Rain, Dorking and District U3A, in chairing the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. This committee provides advice on making U3 activities more inclusive to all members, as well as reaching out to the wider community. To go here again, apologies. One of the trust development plans for key recommendations was to raise the profile of our movement externally. Youth raised from across the UK took part in the first U3A day, delayed a year, this year, and raised their profile within their communities and recruited new members. The national success of the event was in large part due to Sue Stokes, Barnsley U3A, uh, a tireless, uh, for her tireless and inspiring work. Plans are already being made for U3A Day next year as part of us, our 40th anniversary celebrations. Sandy Rickaby 
also chairs, as well as a research and SLP committee, our push, Pushback Ageism Committee, which looks at promoting positive ageing. The Trust is aiming to establish what we call a coalition of common interest with those UK, UK organisations that share our charitable objectives. Already the Trust has started to work with the Centre for Ageing, the Design Age Institute and Voice Global in the North East on a range of issues that, that are of interest to third ages. We've recently appointed a network of PR advisors, member volunteers who work with the nine English regions and the three devolved nations to further embed the name and influence of U3A in local communities via links with the media and local organisations. In the past, it has been difficult for the Trust to capture the attention of the media. However, over the last year, Liz Joy, Head of Communications and External Events, has managed to place items in national and local media outlets. A number of celebrities have supported the Trust during the last year, including Mr Motivator, the Green Goddess, otherwise known as Diana Moran, Esther Ranson, and June Spencer, who I'm sure many of you know plays Peggy Archer in The Archers, and also Esme Young from The Great British Sewing Bee, something I never knew anything about until, <laughs> until I came across Esme Young, but I'm sure many of you do are familiar. Um, the, tr the Trust social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, are increasing their reach and providing a lively platform for members to come together regardless of geographical boundaries. They share experiences and ideas, as well as keeping members up to date with the latest news and information. By the way, have you signed up for the monthly newsletter? If you go to the national website and gain access to a wide, you will gain access to a wide range of information about youth free activity across the country. I want to take, I will now want to take this opportunity to thank the nine regional and three devolved nation trustees for their hard work for both the youth raised in their areas and the trust at a national level, including our Welsh trustee, Chris Winner, who retires from the board today. They have been a truly impressive group of dedicated members. I'm also very, very pleased that the trustees at six of them, the six stood down last year at the AGM. We weren't able to say farewell to them obviously, for obvious reasons, but they've been able to join us here in Kenilworth over these two days, and it's been absolutely wonderful to say a final farewell, very belated, to those trustees that did so much for the board um, up to September last year. In addition to the regional and national trustees, there are three officers, including myself. I owe a very special thanks to my vice chair, Hilary Jones, as well as being a constant source of wise advice on many issues, Hilary has chaired the Development Committee. One of its key aims this year has been to implement the trust plans for developing the movement, an aim that has acquired greater urgency as the movement approaches the end of lockdown. At the heart of its work is a provision of advice on how to retain existing members and to recruit new ones so that the movement remains vibrant and relevant to the next generation. A recruitment and retention toolkit, providing an incredible 22 ideas, has been developed by a team of trust volunteers led by Paul Martinez of Carlton and Gelding U3A. In addition, Hillary has continued to chair the important network link meetings, which have brought together so many of you and are now a valuable vehicle to encourage youth through A's to share experiences, and certainly far more members are joining these network link meetings now that they're online. Richard Tier, our treasurer, runs the trust finances and very effectively chairs the finance committee and the oversight of the implementation of the trust development plan. His financial skills and good humour have, made, have been a great asset to both the movement and myself. <laughs> In the difficult task of managing the trust finances over the last year for a variety of reasons, Richard has been greatly assisted by John Bent, 
trustee for London. Last but no means least, supporting the board and its committees is our CEO, Sam, and her Youth Ray office staff. On behalf of the board and the wider movement, I wish to express our appreciation for the dedication and hard work of Youth Ray staff in providing a near seamless service to members despite the many problems that they've had to overcome during the pandemic. Some of you may know that just before the pandemic, they had to leave the office and, and in fact work from home before it became common practice because the office um, suffered um, uh, flooding damage. As all that know Sam realised that she works tirelessly for the trust and its members, the advice that she provides on charity commission guidelines and UK legislation is of the highest quality. We're very fortunate to have a CEO of Sam's calibre and it's a great comfort to me to have had her wise advice and counsel over the last three years. So we all appreciate the challenges that COVID presents. However, I am certain that by working together, we will overcome them so that the movement will thrive and prosper in the future. As the movement prepares to celebrate its 40th anniversary in 2022, it is in a strong position to take on those challenges and move forward with your new chair, officers and board members. I am sure that our strapline Learn, Laugh, Live will remain as relevant post-pandemic as it did prior to 2020. So now it is time to say goodbye to my, to my colleagues past and present on the board and the Youth Ray office staff. I will miss your friendship, support and unity over the last three years. On that note, all that remains is for me to wish you all the best for the future and with apologies for misquoting the two Ronnies, it is now goodbye from me and hello to Richard who will cover the items three and four on the agenda and deliver the, his report on the last financial year. Thank you very much. You touch my um, no, magic potion. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ian, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the third in the Richard Tier presentation of accounts trilogy. This is the last. Oh, well, you know it's the last one because it's the third. Sorry. Um, before the brickbats fly, I would like to say that being treasurer has been an exciting interesting, and as all things U3A should be, educational experience. I'd like to say that, and I can, <laughs> and I can say that. And, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to broaden my life experiences. Perhaps not in the way I thought, oh no. Shortly, the trust will welcome new officers and a new trustee. And in so doing, We'll say goodbye to Ian and Hilary, and my thanks go to both of them for the advice and assistance that I've received. Lose a winner in Chris, and wait for it, shed a tear. Duh. <laughs> Too much, isn't it? Sorry. That's, apparently, I'm hum apparently, I'm humorous, <laughs> yes. The accounts of the Third Age Trust and its subsidiary, Tattle, have, as you are aware, presented some surprises. I'm going to go behind some of the key figures that have affected the results for this year, give some background on the budget for the current year, the forecasts for the next two years, and finish with some, of the, some thoughts on the reserves. Hopefully, although in statutory format, the accounts you have with you lay out all the relevant information you need to understand the results for the year and where it leaves the trust at the 31st of March. We will be covering the consolidated income and expenditure account, the balance sheet, third age trust trading, this year's budget, the forecasts for the next two years and the reserves. Now here you can see um, a pictorial example of this year's results compared to the previous year's results. Uh, and the slight drop in income and the greater drop in expenditure, resulting in the larger surplus. 
As you know, the main source of income for the Trust is the membership subscription. Unlike many charities who rely... I won't be repeating anything Ian said, by the way. <laughs> Unlike many charities who rely on fundraising for their income, we are in the fortunate position that our income is fairly secure as it is based on membership numbers. While the expenditure, of course, is where we saved a lot of money, you can't run an organisation this size or a group of charities this size without staff, and the main expenditure is the salary costs, comprising salaries, employers' pension and employers' national insurance contributions and office overheads. Prior to the pandemic, the demands on staff were substantial. I'm not going to detail all the ways that U3As and members consult staff on a wide range of matters. And remember, each individual member is entitled to contact the staff, and thousands do. Neither will I go into extensive details of the services that the office staff provides, the office provides here, much of it involving many volunteers as well, as those are all detailed elsewhere in the report. We have some highly talented staff whose efforts on behalf of the U3A movement are often not fully appreciated. You can do so with a, they're in their, well, you know they're in their new polo shirts or a representation of them. They were able to work from home throughout the pandemic, so the high level of service was maintained and many of them have worked over and above their contracted time to provide extra help as the effects of COVID spread. There is obviously still some way to go in upgrading software to enable us all to, enable us all to work efficiently. It's not only staff who need efficient backup facilities. There's an enormous number of volunteers across the regions and devolved nations who give a lot of time and effort in furthering what the U3A movement is all about so that your U3A has access to all the tools it may need. Many of those volunteers have taken it upon themselves to widen the reach of their U3A or subject and group activities by using online facilities. And many have joined the online U3A, as Ian mentioned, with the unexpected bonus that they have formed new connections and made friends up and down the UK. The trust through the staff has been instrumental in providing initiatives, advice and resources to assist. It is a source of great of regret to me and many members that so many U3As shut up shop, whether shown by the We Are Closed banner across their website, or the lack of contact with their members. Other com committees concentrated on serving their members, went out to check their safety and welfare, found the opportunities that even COVID provided, and in some cases increased their membership and they are to be commended. When all said and done, though, as far as the accounts are concerned, with no physical meetings allowed, no travel, commi travel committees or regional, ex regional trustee expenses, all grants were paid, hence the surplus. The balance sheet uh, here will show you the effect on the fixed assets uh, this year in blue, previous year in red. Uh, some of the changes, current assets and, and credits and the things are due to timing differences. But you'll see the result of having a surplus, of course, is the net assets have moved upwards. As you would expect from having a surplus, the balance sheet shows an improvement over the previous year. Apart from the savings in costs due to COVID, the move out of the Lant Street premises in the previous year provided, proved fortuitous for us as while we were looking for alternative offices, which would have involved a five-year lease, Sam discovered the offices that we now use, where the Trust has a rolling six-month licence for serviced accommodation, <coughs> excuse me, instead of a long-term commitment to a lease. This, with staff working from home some days each week now and in future, makes for more efficient use of office space and services as we may expand or contract the size should circumstances dictate. The remaining assets we have are those related to IT, laptops and iPads, so a small amount. The write-off of the beacon upgrade payment, which was uh, capitalised last year, I'll cover in the Tattle report. At the year end, debtors included outstanding advertising commission receipts and receipts for beacon licences that had recently been issued. Trade creditors and the loan to Tattle remain in total much the same. These cover TAM production and distribution costs and other expenses. 
accruals and deferred income, which is income received prior to the 31st of March that relates to the current year, and outstanding invoices are up slightly due to timing differences, but otherwise it is a healthy balance sheet. Tattle, <coughs> sources of income, are largely TAM and Beacon licences. Advertising income for TAM, largely from travel and cruise companies pre-lockdown, held up well and was replaced by other advertisers during the lockdowns. TAM is, in terms of advertising reach, high up in the list of desirable magazines in which to advertise, and it didn't take advertising agencies long to realise that U3A members have a fair amount of money to spend on other things than frequent cruises and holidays. I haven't experienced those, by the way, just in case you're worried. The number of U3As taking Beacon uh, has continued to increase as more U3As realise the benefits of time saving and organisation it brings. And that number is now within a hair's breadth of 500 U3As. We've got a summary there just of the surplus TAM produced and what's happened with Beacon, which did actually produce a surplus before the write-off of the £81,000. Um, Beacon is not subsidised by the Trust because although it is available to all U3As, it is not used by all U3As and must be self-financing. The surplus it makes is to cover previous expenditure and to fund the upgrade. If your U3As are a Beacon user, you'll be aware of the problems highlighted by N we've had regarding the upgrade. Suffice it to say that the <coughs> approved partner failed to carry out work on the first stage and the upgrade is being reviewed. Tattles have challenged the partner to meet their contractual obligations and we've been guided by our lawyers in how we best do that. We believe that we are making good progress towards what would be a satisfactory conclusion in the circumstances. Meanwhile, we're determined to achieve the best possible outcome for the Trust and U3A members and the commitment to the Beacon community has been further strengthened to ensure that the current Beacon system serves U3As and their members as effectively as possible. And I think here we should commend the Beacon team and help desk members for their enthusiasm and support. Uh, as I say, the initial payment of 81,000 in connection with the upgrade has been written off in the accounts in line with accounting requirements that require us to do so where there may be a doubt uh, in recovering the, the money. Merchandise, previously organised and supplied by the office staff, has been outsourced to Brand IQ, the brand centre on the website, following the rebranding and replaces the shop. Tattle decides the products after consultation with members and Brand IQ source, agree the sale price, complete the order, collect payment prior to dispatch, organise delivery and forward the proceeds net of their commission to Tattle. This has made the shop much more efficient, a much more efficient one-stop shop. With this change and other income lines coming in, Tattle produced a surplus prior to the write-off, as can be seen on the slide. I should perhaps branch out, watch out, I should perhaps branch out here and say that Tattle is preparing the ground for the planting of trees as a U3A would as part of the 40th anniversary celebrations. You probably knew that. Leafing that aside, the Trust has achieved a surplus and is in a better position than it was at the beginning of the financial year for some entirely unexpected, but hopefully, as far as COVID is concerned, not to be repeated reasons. Now there, I'll leave the accounts for now and move on to the budget for the current year. You should have a copy of the budget from which you'll see that there is a budgeted deficit. The narrative explains how we've arrived at the figures, but the headline is obviously the level of membership subscription income. We know from research over the last year that membership numbers have fallen. I know that's not exactly news. Uh, some U3As closed, others gave a free year's membership. On the other hand, many embraced the difficulties and continued online. But with differing membership renewal dates, it has been difficult for some U3As to, be, to give accurate figures of what their member numbers will be in the current year. The Trust decided that member numbers as at the 31st of March should be taken as the base number for the subscriptions, 
although some leeway has been given where renewal dates are in April, May and June. The returns received to date confirm a fall of 19%, which is, gives us confidence that the budgeted 20% fall will not be exceeded. Back to this magic potion. Oh, I might have some more then. The chair's just going to get it, it topped up for me. Um, although the Tattle budget has a further reduction in budgeted income for both TAM and Beacon, due to the corresponding fall in the number of members taking TAM and Beacon licences, with the Brand Centre and Click and Save bringing in income, there is a budgeted surplus for Tattle of £69,000. Moving on to the expenses, after provision for a hybrid AGM, a few events, insurances, licences and other costs. Provision has been made for project costs of £148,000 as the development plan, as detailed in the budget narrative, comes into effect. Allowance is also made for some committee and regional trustee costs in anticipation of some physical meetings, although online meetings have been recommended. Overhead costs include all the costs for running the business of the charity, to some that's a contradiction, but charities actually have a business which is actually running the charity. Office rent, telephones, software licences, legal and audit fees, staff training, PR, raising the profile, and Site Builder, which is the U3A website provider, the U3A's website provider. This leaves the budget for the mainstay of the U3A movement, staff costs consisting of salaries, employers' pension contributions and employers' national insurance contributions and related costs. So the staff costs, um, following the uh, restructure, the office now runs on a total of 18 staff supervised by Sam. The deputy CEO and head of internal services, Sarah Clark, overseeing all of the trust systems and support functions. The head of member services, Alison May, overseeing learning, beacon and advice and volunteering and the Head of Policy and Communication, overseeing communications and external affairs, PR and media, the website and policy at Liz Drury. This is already enabling a more efficient and effective service to support you through ACE with all the regulatory advisance and guidance, and regulations seem to change far too regularly, assisting the officers, regional trustees, support groups and 300 volunteers, 1,048 youth UAs and individual members with inquiries, and providing a wide range of services to U3As and all individual members. Moving on to the forecasts for the next two years. As I hope you would expect, the Board spends a considerable time on agreeing the budget and forecasts, which in the years up to 31st of March 2020 were all based on rising member numbers. <clears throat> Last year, that all changed, and while the budget is generally more certain in its outcome, Forecasts are more difficult to nail as we're looking further into the future. Now, with more uncertainties and unknowns than many of us will have experienced. It would have been easy to have taken an optimistic view, or indeed a pessimistic view, of life to come, not just for U3As. And we have spent much more time this year <clears throat> discussing and agreeing what we all hope are realistic budgets. Both the budget and forecast together show that the Trust may not return to a surplus over the next three years to 31st of March 2024, because the forecast project losses despite the increase in membership subscription to £4 per member from the 1st of April next year. This is because we anticipate further falls in membership <coughs> numbers, principally because of the uncertainty due to the pandemic and how that will affect the youth ray model, while members gain confidence in returning to physical me meetings and new members are recruited. The Trust is now introducing software that will enable youth rays to view their account in real time, recording member numbers on renewal, payments made, etc., which will provide benefits in calculating the membership renewal subscriptions in future. Moving on to the reserves, here you'll see the reserves set out as at 2021 in blue compared to the figures for the previous year in red. 
and the restricted reserves of the Barbara Lewis Fund, which is to assist, set up to assist in U3A startups. And, <coughs> excuse me, as a consequence of COVID, to enable relaunches. The general reserves, including the prudential sum of £850,000 to cover a closure situation of £1,298,000, <coughs> which are available to cover losses and unforeseen events, and the designated reserves to cover the development plan of £446,000. Uh, nothing was spent in the last year on that. The capital budget for this year provide, uh, includes a provision for expenditure of £175,000 from this reserve. Uh, moving on to the next slide, you'll see that the, the figures uh, just expressed in a different way. Um, looking at the figure, uh, pay attention please, two lines up in the right hand column and comparing that with the figure one more line up in the same column will allow you to calculate the increase of the reserves in the accounts over the last two years. Uh, and that slide's really there to give you something to do as compared to just reading the previous slides. Um, some considerations for the use of reserves. This is, reserves are always a difficult thing because we all like to build reserves in case of a crisis and what have we just had? Um, so I thought it'd be useful to highlight some of the considerations that affect the purpose and use of the general reserves. Specific reserves can obviously only be used for specific purposes by nature of the name. But general reserves can be drawn upon for any uh, legitimate use and should be used. For now, we have sufficient reserves to cover what none of us hope will happen, continuing lockdown periods and a more dramatic fall off in members as a result of the pandemic. We need to be attracting new, no longer in full-time employment but not retired members, which will take time, effort and expense. And you'll notice I'm deliberately saying not retired because a lot of people will not be retired and will be looking for this opportunity. The development and implementation of one digital strategy to improve IT systems and support to members and to enable greater communication and sharing of learning materials is what the designated reserve should cover. The continuing rollout of the member recruitment plan, possibly restating bullet point two, but it's worth the, the emphasis because that will cost. Continued investment in U3A services, admittedly part of the digital strategy, but existing software doesn't stand still. Like most of us, it needs to keep moving. Learning programmes and agreements with national institutions are self-explanatory, but some of these will come at a cost. And no, I didn't forget the learning portal for access by every U3A member. This is very important, as we need to be ahead of the game on this, as other organisations are looking at our model and will cherry pick from us. In fact, only the other day, a new commercial organisation, uh, thanks to Sam for pointing this out, obtained a pre-seed funding of £800,000. That means they've, they've obtained £800,000 to exist their previous similar amount to set their model up before they go public and asking share shareholders for money or investment. For its platform, which currently allows over 60s to host or participate in activities and socialising both online and eventually offline too. Does that sound vaguely familiar? Longer term, their goal is to become the go-to platform for all over 60s social, physical and financial needs. Their founder, a former Age UK volunteer and former chief executive of the Care Workers Charity, is quoted as saying, while dialogue around an ageing population focuses on the growing burden on health services, which I've just been taking advantage of, <laughs> my experience sees a generation of people with more energy, desire for life and time than ever before. I've got the link to that article if anybody would like to read more about it. We are a family of U3As, independent maybe, but surely sharing with our members. That should mean that the trust as head of the family has a duty, an obligation, to be looking at support programmes for U3As to help in the use of online technology to better manage, for example, further lockdowns, to help interest groups where there are caring duties and or mobility issues, and help U3A committees overcome obstacles. In fact, in leading and providing the resources to promote the values of lifelong learning 
and the positive attributes of belonging to a U3A directly to all members, which is not top-down, in my opinion, as some mistakenly believe, but to paraphrase a current TV advertisement, it's a family thing. We can't afford to stand still or stop learning, either as U3As or as individuals. And there will no doubt be as yet undiscovered things to consider. We have the reserves to do that. How we do it is up to all of us. Finally, I would like to thank Sam particularly for all her patience in dealing with a, a some, oh, humorous, sometimes grumpy old man, calmly and sagely, to John Bent for his work on the accounts this year particularly, the trustees I've worked with, and all the staff for their help. Best wishes to you all and the continuing and new board member. No, board members. <laughs> That concludes my report, but before we go to questions, I'd like, if I may, to look ahead a couple of weeks into the future, when a former officer of the Trust, be that Ian, Hilary or myself, may be asked, as they leave home and set out for the day, worry-free, assuming there are no COVID restrictions, or meeting a friend sitting on a park bench overlooking a beauty spot. But that, that friend or person might say, as they ponder the view, what are you doing today? Mm, I should say nothing. Well, you did that yesterday. Yes, but I wasn't finished. <laughs> and as a well-known speaker once said, that's all from me. And if you have been listening, thank you. And now over to questions. OK, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we now would like to open the message box. So you can submit any questions, both here and online, uh, or any comments um, that you may wish to make on the accounts from Richard or my chair's report. If you would like to submit a comment or question, select the messaging icon at the top of your screen on the navigation bar. Type your message within the text box at the bottom of the messaging screen, and then click the send button to the right of the text box to submit. We will have a five minute break while you submit your questions and we can gather them together. For the questions and answer period, we will endeavor to read and answer and all the questions and comments that have been submitted. But due to time constraints, we may not be able to address every question during the meeting. In the, event, in the event that we cannot answer all questions during the meeting, we will provide a mailing with the relevant questions and answers in as, soon, as soon as after the meeting as is possible. To ensure that we can answer as many questions as possible, uh, we can only accept one question per U3A. If you are in the room today and have a question, please raise your hand and a member of the team will guide you to the microphone. We're now going to have a five-minute break, and the time will start ticking, I hope. Do we have any questions from the public?
Right. Thank you, for, thank you very much for your comments and questions. The way we're going to do this is we're going to take two questions online, and then Bob has put his hand up. He's going to ask his question. That will be the third one. Uh, Sam is going to read them out, and then I will allocate them to one of the one of the people up at the top of the table here, ensuring that I don't have to answer any of the questions. So, so right. So, um, can, Sam, can we have the first question that's coming online? We'll have two questions from online. Yeah. So, <clears throat> the first two questions online um, relate one to the other. The first is from Ian Daesh in Guernsey. Is Beacon 2 still a reality? And the second is Chris Gowan, St Albans. Is the continued commitment to Beacon a case of flogging a dead horse? Right. Well, that's to the point. So, uh, Sam, right. you will respond to that. OK, thank you. So, yes, uh, Beacon 2 is still a reality. The Trust is, um, at the moment, about to spend some time looking at Beacon uh, through the lens of a digital strategy. Uh, and we are very clear that uh, Beacon 2 is very important to all Beacon users. And during the year, you will get updates on, on the progress of how that's going to, of how that's going to um, be considered going forward. And we will be uh, speaking with you about plans for Beacon 2. Thank you. Do we have a second question from online? Um, so the, the next question online is, thank you for beginning to outline the staff structure in your reports. Is a fuller staff structure with responsibilities available to help U3As available to help U3As know who best to communicate with? And that's from David Martin in Ilkeston. Well, it's you again. It's me again, yep. Yeah. So, uh, yes, um, there is a, uh, a staff structure uh, available, a uh, organogram, um, with who is responsible for different activities and services that the, that the staff provide. Uh, that's going to be extended to include uh, Trust Volunteers too, and we will be uh, making that available through the, uh, the, the regional and national trustees for circulation as they see fit in presentations to U3As. So we'll now take a question from the meeting here. Bob, Bob Duckmanson. Yeah, hello. Oh, that's uh, I'm not tall enough for the microphone. <laughs> um, this is a question for Richard, actually. Um, I'm looking at your um, your budget 2021 statement. Does that, have you included in your budgeting going forward for the uh, membership going up again because you know we we put it up last this year but uh, you know and I know there's a new board but I'm very concerned that you know we, we don't seem to be forecasting the membership uh, fee going up so so are you is it on your radar or is it something we'll have to work that's on the, next year the increase in the subscription yeah subscription that's what I meant subscription um, I, I finished off by saying if you have been listening thank you <laughs> Bob. Um, <laughs> Because I said both the, bu the <clears throat> budget and forecast together uh, include projected losses despite the increase in membership subscription to four pounds per member from the 1st of April next year. So this year's budget isn't, well, for two years beyond. Yeah, we've only forecast for the two years after this year. It's very difficult after that to make forecasts. They're somewhat irrelevant, but... Yeah, it's taken into account in the two forecasts for 22, 23, and 23, 24. Okay. Thank you. Two questions from online, but is, can anybody put their hand up if they are intending to ask a question from this meeting? Ah, yes, right, thank you. I'll take two questions um, online, and then we'll come... What was the reasoning behind the closure of the resource library? Was it financial? And why were U3As not made more aware of the forthcoming closure? And the second question is, Fleet U3A, or comment actually, Fleet U3A would like to thank Ian and all outgoing trustees for their hard work, support and advice. 
We always know where to go to when we have a query, and it's always answered expertly. Thank you. That's fine. Nice. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the board and Sam. So, Sam, you'll answer the question on the Resource Centre. Yeah. So, um, the Resource Centre uh, consisted of uh, DVDs and a lot of, and, and a very small number of uh, repeat users use those DVDs. Uh, the cost of actually sending the DVDs out by a member of staff and put it in a package and actually then having it returned and recatalogued was more, far more, than the actual cost of the DVD itself. And having undertaken some consultation with the members of the kind of you know U3A interest groups of the kind of um, the kind of resources that U3As are using, uh, DVDs um, didn't feature very highly. U3As use a lot of other resources, uh, but DVDs didn't feature very highly. So there was uh, some consultation with um, how, how, to, uh, how to progress that. And um, in particular, uh, there was discussion, I think, with any subject advisors who may have wanted to, uh, to take charge of, of some part of those DVDs themselves. Um, and uh, there was several communications out to U3As about the fact that the, uh, the, D the resource library in the form of DVDs is closing. However, what I would say is the learning, uh, the learning portal and learning hub going forward is aimed to collect uh, and gather access to all sorts of learning resources for U3A interest groups, um, including some of the fantastic material that U3As themselves produce, and for example, the out outputs of uh, some of the SLPs, and of course, all of the other learning facilities that U3A users use. Thank you. So, do we have another second question? A second question. Um, our group is becoming concerned about the cost and efficiency of Beacon. Is the trust looking at an alternative system? So that really relates to, I think, the first two questions we had relating to Beacon. Um, and um, yes, the, what, what, the, what the trust uh, will be doing is looking at options for Beacon 2 and making sure that we have a system which is uh, fit for purpose for U3As and which U3As feel comfortable and confident with using. Um, um, but most important, important of all, of course, it does have to be uh, cost efficient and it does have to be user friendly for U3As. Thank you. The gentleman the back. Th thank you. Uh, Tony Cheatham, uh, Preston and District U3A. Uh, I'd just like to make a couple of comments and then follow that up with a question. And it's, it's basically about our digital strategy. I fully endorse the strategy of, the, of, particularly during the pandemic, that we have become much more digitally aware. And many of us have kept our organizations going effectively through uh, online forums, the use of Zoom, running our monthly meetings online, uh, and even, in my own case, having Desert Island Discs, which is something I I've always wanted to appear on. But my key point about that is that I think it's abs absolutely important that while embracing that, we must retain the social, what I call the social integrity and the financial integrity of our organization and its, and, and, and its main mission. And in doing that, we mustn't become um, an army of sofa surfers and talking heads. What dangers and what opportunities do the board in particular see um, in respect of that? In other words, how do you see the threats and how do you see the opportunities? So, um, so one of the uh, one of the areas that um, that Jeff is going to outline shortly is is the future strategy of the trust. And absolutely, um, the board have said in their discussions that um, that there's a there's a, there's a two pronged approach that's come out of the pandemic. The fantastic opportunity to meet online and where people can 
join, uh, who maybe may be able to join before because maybe they have caring duties, for example, or it's the travel's dif uh, difficult, um, and being able to join in a U3A, and the really important aspect of people coming together and meeting together uh, on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, so, and, and yes, of course, there are, um, there are opportunities and challenges in both. Certainly, uh, the, uh, the history of the trust, uh, the history of U3A movement, rather, um, and its massive success has been on people forming communities by coming together and meeting face to face. And that will continue. I think there's no suggestion that actually that face to face won't continue in future. The question is how do we maximise uh, the ability now to go online uh, without, without disrupting that model? but at the same time complementing that model. And one, what, the, uh, what the trustees are about to do, and I've had their first initial conversations about, is when we're building our strategy going forward, how do we make sure that everybody is included, no one's left out, and everyone can take the most of those opportunities? What, what they are going to be doing is asking U3As and U3A members about their thoughts about how that should happen to build that into that strategy. So we're right at the very beginning. There has been some initial very high level looks at you know what, what, what's the strengths, what the weaknesses, what the challenges are. Um, and we're going to be coming out to all of you to get your comments and views on that. But what's really important and what the board are really clear about is everybody needs to be included. Thank you, Thank you very much. Do you have any more? Yes. That's just two more questions. I think time is running on. Yep. But um, shall I do the last three that we've got yeah, on there? Yeah. So, um, so, the f so Chris Wardle from Cheltenham said, uh, have you or do you intend to carry out a lessons, lessons learnt exercise on the Beacon Upgrade project? Um, shall I answer that one? Yep. Yep. So yes, absolutely. Uh, and we've begun to do that already. We've begun to draw what we've learned uh, from that, from that uh, process, what... Um, what extra, what extra value do we have now that we didn't have before? Um, and what actually um, we have learned that hadn't gone so well that we would uh, avoid doing again. So definitely we'll have that. And um, we'll be able to uh, provide um, some, some information about how that looks uh, going out because some of that thinking will come into the strategy about how we move forward with Beacon. So then we had uh, Mary, uh, Mary Aileen Smith, Samir from the Isle of Arran, apologies uh, if I've got the pronunciation incorrectly there. Will we get copies of both reports? Yes, you will. Uh, thank you for that. And then finally, uh, Anne Hobson says, from Sandwell U3A, we would like to thank Alan Wormsley for all his persistence and his enthusiasm during this difficult time. That is all of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, th I think that, that <laughs> completes all the, que all the so questions. So we've had all the questions online, which is quite amazing, because in September there were reams of them, weren't mm. there? We had uh, terrific numbers. I don't quite know what's happened that day. Perhaps everybody's happy with us. Yeah. Um, any questions? One last opportunity for anybody here to ask a question. Right. Well, thank you very much for that. And as I said, um, the answers will be, and the reports, etc., will be made available to the members. Right, so we need to move on. Time is going on. We now move to vote on Resolution 3 and Resolution 4. So we're going back to the process that we had at the start with the minutes of the last AGM and EGM. We will read out both, or I will read out both resolutions, and we will ask for proposers and seconders for each resolution. I'll do the same as last time, one here and one, the second one on the Internet, and then vote for both resolutions in one round of voting. The resolutions are as follows. To receive and approve the annual report and accounts for the year ending the 31st of March 2021. Please may I have a U3A to propose this resolution and a U3A to second this resolution. Type propose or second within the text box at the bottom of the messaging screen and then click the send button to the right of the text box to submit. You all know how to do this now. Um, and then, um, so I just wait for um, somebody from the floor here to, yes, gentlemen, uh, lady, I can't see, uh, screen lady, I think, yes, you wish you 3A and name, please. Yeah, 
So uh, Dunstable and Marion Clark, was it? Sally Clark. Oh, right, Sally Clark, right, okay. And have we got somebody? Marion Colligan, Cheltenham. Yeah. Cheltenham. Right, so I can confirm that, and I've just gone and forgotten. Um, which use of? Sally Clark. Yeah, Sally Clark from? Dunstable. Dunstable, that's right. It's getting, I'm get, getting a bit tired now. And... Um, Morgan Colligan, Cheltenham. Thank you. Now we'll move straight on before the vote to a a resolution four to appoint Hayes McIntyre as the auditors and to authorise the board of directors to set their remuneration. Please may I have a youth rate to propose this resolution and a youth rate to second it. Type propose or second within the text box at the bottom of the messaging screen and then click the send button to the right of the text box to submit. Thank you. So do we have a proposer for, yes? Lynn Jones, Daventry District. Daventry. So Lynn Jones, I'll write this down. Lynn Jones, Daventry. Not too far from here. And do we have one? Yes, I'm pleased to say that Ian Daish from Guernsey the U3A. Ian. Daesh from Guernsey, Daesh. the U3A. Oh, yes, yeah. he came, yes. Guernsey, yeah. right. Right, so, thank you. I can confirm that uh, Lynn Jonas has uh, proposed on behalf of Daventry and District, and um, Ian Daesh has proposed, uh, seconded on behalf of Guernsey. I will now open the poll for you to cast your votes on item three and four on the agenda. The slide reminds you how to cast your votes, all experienced in this, and I'll keep this open for two minutes now because there are two resolutions to give you time to vote. The poll is now open. Please vote now. And there will be a countdown for two minutes. Right, thank you very much. Uh, the poll is now closed, and for the last time, the results should appear on your screen after 20 seconds has elapsed. I wonder what the results will be. Right, so resolution 3, 4, 512, against 2 and resolution 4, 513 against 2. 
withheld 12 and 6 respectively. So thank you. that completes that. So now we, and I declare the resolution 3 and 4 passed. We now move on to agenda item 6 to announce the appointment of the chair, vice chair and treasurer for the next three years. These elections have taken place entirely online. There was a contested election for the chair and vice chair of the trust and the, and the treasurer was uncontested. I will read out the relevant voting statistics for the contested elections. Chair of the Third Age Trust, 117 U3As with 373 available votes were cast in the elections for the officers. The results for the election of the chair for the Third Age Trust were as follows. Bell Shepherd received 100 votes and Liz Thackeray received 258 votes. I am pleased to announce that Liz Thackeray from Flintshire U3A um, has been elected as your new chair of the Third Age Trust. Congratulations to you. For vi Vice Chair of the Third Age Trust, um, 176 from 300 votes from 373 U3As. Michaela, Michaela Moody received 263 votes and Sooth Southwell received 94 votes. I'm pleased, therefore, to announce that Michaela Moody of Woodhall Spa U3A was elected as Vice Chair of the Third Age Trust. Okay. <laughs> Treasurer of the Third Age Trust. Uh, this was uncontested, as I've mentioned, and so I'm pleased to announce that Derek Harwood of Islington U3A was elected as Treasurer of the Third Age Trust. Good. Uh, we now move to, on to the item, uh, agenda item seven to announce the appointment of three trustees to serve as ordinary directors. These elections have taken place again by on, online ballot within each of the regions concerned. None of the three elections were contested. Therefore, East Midlands, Jean Hogg um, from Southwell or Southall U3A, I think even the people there don't quite know how to pronounce that, but anyway, I will call it Southwell U3A, has been re-elected for a further year's term in line with the trust articles. In London, John Bent from Barnet U3A uh, has similarly been re-elected for a further um, four years term in line with the articles. And in Wales, we have one new trustee, uh, Sue Shannon-Jones from Swansea. And um, so I congr congratulate all three of you on being elected to the board and a particular mention for Sue. Where is Sue, Sue Shannon-Jones? There, well done. It's quite unusual. I can't remember in seven years, only one trustee um, actually standing for re-election. Um, it's normally six, it was six last year, so um, I'm sure you will get a lot of advice from, from all your co-directors. So congratulations to Sue. Right, and welcome to all the new trustees. Uh, we now move on fairly quickly, because time is running away with us, uh, to those youth 3 as that are celebrating an anniversary this year. For those that attended physical AGMs in the past, the youth 3 as came up onto the stage um, and uh, they had their hands shaken, but that's not been possible uh, this year. But here we are. I'll go through the youth 3 as that are celebrating um, various anniversaries. Five years. There's Guernsey. I've just seen Guernsey. <coughs> Mill Hill, I was involved in five years away. Goodness me. That was before your time, John. Can I move on to the next one now? I know you said 20 seconds. We need to move on fairly quickly if we can. So those youth that are celebrating 10, quite a few of them. Anybody recognize any? Your own, it can be Ireland. That's give you a chance to, to look at them. Quite popular 10 years. Move on to 15 years. Oh, there we are. Southwell, or Southall, U3A, 15 years. 
20 years. Good number here. Twenty five years. Barnsley. Barnsley. Oh nobody's ne nobody's ever heard of Barnsley at all. <laughs> Completely unknown in the <laughs> Right, thirty years. Good number. And last but not least, those that have been in existence for 35 years. Sheffield is the biggest youth VA in, in the movement, about 3,000 members. Good. Oh, I see Canterbury. We have representatives from Canterbury and District here. So good. <laughs> Congratulations on 35 years. That's a, a long, long time. Right, so yes, thank you to all our youth raids for your hard work and commitment to the movement that have been listed here. Thank you for all your patience and stamina, and I now declare the AGM closed. But just before I do so, I just want to make a couple of presentations, or three. Now, I know that Sam loves flowers. She's, so. So thanks for everything. Oh, thank you very much. Gosh, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's absolutely lovely. Wow, thank you. <laughs> and the, the other lady that's kept me in order over the last few years, always done as I've been told. <laughs> well done. And for my good friend Richard, something to celebrate three years. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Good. Okay, so um, that's the end of the AGM. Um, now we're looking to the future, and Jeff is going to say a few words to you. Thank you, Ian. Um, Gosh, don't I look young in that picture? <laughs> X number of years ago as a trustee, and that's what it does for you. Never mind. Anyway, thank you, Ian. Um, the, the trust is looking at the future following the impact of the pandemic, which has made a, a major impact on the way youth raise meet and learn together. And we want to use the ideas and initiatives that have come out of this difficult time to help us shape the, the next stage in the life of the movement. But first, what do we mean by the Third Age Trust and its relationship with U3As? But the, rea the reality is the Third Age Trust encompasses the whole movement. All U3As are members of the Trust, and there are over 300 volunteers providing valuable support, a small staff team coordinating the work and providing advice and guidance, and the board who provide the strategic direction and governance. Together, we are all the Third Age Trust, and so together, we must shape our future. We must ensure that the movement remains robust, focused and resilient and that that responsibility belongs to all of us. We know that many of you feel that the decisions taken by the trust seem remote. And that all, uh, however, all the trustees of, and volunteers are ordinary U3A members and bring that knowledge to the board and its committees. The main ones being the board itself, which sets the strategic direction making all the major policy decisions. There's the Finance Committee that, that carefully stewards the resources of the Trust to best meet the requirements of the Trust to support the movement. The Governance Committee oversees the legal responsibilities and duties of the Board and the legal documentation, policies and procedures and guidance required by the movement. Communications and External Affairs supports the marketing, PR, communications of the Trust for the U3A movement. The Development Committee is responsible for the support, advice and guidance offered to U3As. The Learning Committee develops the U3A learning model, coordinating the ideas and advice from U3As, subject advisors and research. In addition, there are many working groups, 
that support the work of the board and these committees. Everyone involved at all levels is also a U3A member bringing that grassroots experience with them. Separately, the trading company, a subsidiary of the charity, investigates any trading opportunities that may show some benefit for the membership. In order to have a, a starting point for considering the future and how we respond to it, the trustees met at the end of the June to begin the process. And the aim really was to provide some initial thinking as a basis for a consultation on priorities for the future. The trustees looked at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats as currently perceived, drawing on their experience and expertise. They also considered whether any areas of new activity or potential partnerships or approaches that could be adopted. And from these initial deliberations, four key aims emerged. These are, number one, to support an engaged, strong and vibrant movement. Secondly, to make the U3A membership an attractive opportunity for all retired people. Number three, to develop the, the U3A voice. And finally, maximising the U3A learning model. If we look at each one of these in turn, that supporting the movement, the trustees want to ensure that the future was framed in a positive and aspirational way and that it was predicated on ensuring that U3As received robust, consistent and supportive services. And, and three main pillars towards achieving this aim. Firstly, providing foundation and structural support, legal advice, insurance, operational advice line and, and emails, support in difficult and complex situations and mediation, workshops and training. And second pillar is to provide a platform for U3As to share their experience and successes and skills. Thirdly, provide a platform for innovation and development. At this stage, the thinking is described in a broad way as we'll be asking you to provide us with your thinking and your ideas. And aim two, how to make the, the, the member attractive to more membership. And the, currently, the, the average age of those in membership of the trust is getting older. We do, we need to attract people across a wider age range. And the two pillars attached to this aim were concerned with how to engage with potential as well as new and existing members. What makes membership an exciting offer? Thinking behind this is as follows. The Third Age Trust can promote memberships of U3As by having an attractive and engaging website, both national and local, social media engagement, national awareness campaigns, uh, and providing a range of opportunities and services to individuals as members of the movement in terms of learning opportunities, voice opportunities, products and services, programs and community engagement. The third aim, aim is developing the U3A voice. It's an area of work that's already had increasing support by uh, in, uh, members over the last 18 months. Uh, and its importance is to demonstrate the active engagement of retired people in local communities, regions and nations, as has been expressed by many members. To support these areas of work, the key suggestions are that the Third Age Trust will provide a platform to demonstrate the productivity and creativity of retired people locally, regionally and nationally. Engage with U3As and U3A members in conferences, consultations and policies to it change the narrative on ageing and develop partnerships with like-minded organisations to promote productivity and creative narrative. And finally, turning to what U3As are all about and maximising the U3A learning model. The U3A has a, has a unique learning model which is developed at pace across the movement based on the principles of the U3A founding fathers. It has at its core sharing the expertise, enthusiasm and perspectives of members in the learning experience. The Trust wants to continue to respect and foster that peer learning approach. To do so, it was felt that the following themes were important. That the, that the Trust documents the learning model to make it more explicit. We promote that model within the movement. We develop the shared learning program and contribute to the development of peer-led learning with like-minded organisations. And as I said at the beginning of this presentation, the Third Age Trust is all of us. You in the U3As are as our members, the volunteers, the staff and the board. All of us need to shape our future 
and this is how we'd like you to do it. The strategy of the Trust belongs to us all, and we want to consult with you on these four initial aims. We want your ideas and suggestions about them, the wording and whether they are the right aims, and fundamentally, what do you want the Trust to do for you? We also want your thoughts on how to achieve and measure these progress of these aims, as well as their impact. We'll begin the consultation on the initial four aims and how to achieve them between September and October. This will be through an online questionnaire, focus groups, dedicated email, address strategy at uca.org.uk, and the board will then review the results in November, and an update to the movement on the next steps will follow from that. So please look out for opportunities to get involved and get your thoughts and ideas in to contribute to the future of the U3A movement. Thank you. Back to Ian. Thank you very much, Jeff, uh, for what Cheryl, is... Could I just ask a quick question? Yes, of course. Sorry. There's a big portrait from the U3A. Oh, so very, very local. Kenilworth. <laughs> um, are you going to... Branches to respond. Well, you can answer that, but that's the intention. But yeah, do you want yeah. to just say? Yeah. Um, Sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's right. No, yes, the, the, we will be actually putting out um, a questionnaire and an email communication to all U3As. Yeah. So we want as much information in as we, we can get um, because this is our thinking. We want your thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I look forward to, um, from a distance, seeing how this, um, this strategy works, Jeff. Um, it should be, it's a very exciting time, and uh, I'm sure you'll get a lot of response from the membership. Right, I, somebody on my right just wants to stand up and say something, which it wasn't on my, yeah. <laughs> on my schedule, so I've been thrown. Uh, so this, uh, this, I think we all wanted to say goodbye to Ian um, for his... Uh, for his wise counsel and guidance and steering us through a, uh, a, a, a really unprecedented uh, period of time. So this is from us. Thank you very much, Ian, for Thanks. all you've done. Uh, we really, really appreciate everything you've done for us. It's Thank been you a pleasure. Um, Thanks very much. <laughs> Right, so I'd now like to introduce Liz to you as your new chair. Um, he's going to say a few words, and then you will introduce your new officers. So, so it's goodbye for me, finally, and a warm welcome to Liz. Well, hello, everybody. At the moment, I feel a little bit like the rabbit um, with the headlights sort of picture, but um, let's see what happens. Um, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you and to introduce myself. Some people will know me from various online places. Others will not know anything very much about me at all. I'm not going to talk a lot about myself because given the number of things I've had to do in this last fortnight by way of press releases, interviews and so on, there's going to be so much stuff around that I don't need to tell you about myself. Instead, what I want to do first of all is to say, like others, I want to personally take the opportunity to thank Hilary, Richard, Ian and Chris for all they've contributed to the Trust and the Third Age movement. None of them are disappearing completely, I hope, um, but I do hope that they'll be able to rediscover the meaning of recreation. And I understand that Ian's doing something about his golf handicap every time I talk to him. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was tempted when I heard the comments about online and face-to-face -to, -face to almost throw away the notes I'd prepared and say something about that, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to say, whatever else, we're not going to turn into cy cyborgs. Um, next year, as we all know, the Third Age Movement celebrates its 40th birthday. Michaela is going to be talking about some of the things that we're hoping and planning for next year. But I want to focus just more generally on celebration. 
And celebration is something that I'm very aware that you 3A members are good at. And it was quite remarkable to see all the stuff that was coming out last June when so many U3As, despite all the restrictions on us, were organising so many different events and activities to showcase what the U3A is about and what the vast range of activities and pursuits engaged in is. And we've got something to shout about and we need to shout about it. We have so much to celebrate when we consider the size and the spread of our movement and how we've shown our adapt adaptability and creativity as we've learned to meet in different ways and to keep our interest groups alive and, in many cases, gain new members, which is quite remarkable in the year that's 18 months that's just gone. And next year, we're going to have a real focus on celebrating. Thank it all, we're going to be 40. 40 is an age to celebrate. And hopefully that will lead to us further raising our profile locally, regionally and nationally. Many of us in this room are meeting ourselves for meeting people for the first time in person. Yesterday, um, the current board, those people who retired 18 months ago or thereabouts, and as newcomers, were all here. And you had the usual shocks of what do people look like, how, what do we differ online, because we all knew what we looked like from the neck up. Beyond that, yes. Um, but I want to think about perceptions, not only online, but in person. And I want to tell you about my brother. He's three years younger than me. And we discovered in a recent conversation that he is also a U3A member. And he told me about his first encounter with a U3A group. There he was, a newly retired consultant surgeon and he wanted to learn to play bridge. Bridge had been a favourite pastime of our father, and we both tried to avoid learning anything about cards in our youth. Um, but he discovered that the local U3A had a bridge group, so he turned up in the appropriate place, got to the room, and he felt both very young and very male. The good news is that he went into that room, he was made very welcome and discovered, somewhat to his surprise, that the older women in the room could teach him a thing or two, <laughs> and not only about bridge. <laughs> we need to ensure that others, like my brother, are enabled to find their way to our activities, to overcome their false perceptions, to go through those doors, to find out that they have got a lot to learn, as well as a lot to give to the movement, to other people in their local communities. Thinking of the U3A movement, one of the pictures that comes into my mind is a river. We've all seen rivers of different shapes and sizes, and my mind turns to the Danube, one of the longest rivers in Europe. Its origin is a spring in an obscure Black Forest town. Very strange little town, worth a visit though. And as that river flows through Germany, with all the different tributaries joining it, by the time it reaches Passau, it's a mighty river carrying freight and cruise ships. And as it travels on towards the Black Sea, at times it out, opens out into wide lagoons where all is peaceful, but further on it's confined by gorges and faces the danger of rocks and dangerous currents. Twisting and turning its way through the landscape, the river flows on. The Youth A movement, the Third Age movement, had small beginnings. We have grown beyond all recognition. Over the last 18 months, we've survived and we've survived unknown, unseen dangers that nobody ever expected. But now our journey is going to be taking us forward. We cannot predict all the challenges, but we must take note of Richard's comment about others occupying what we consider to be our territory and looking at how we 
move forward with some of these dangers we are now aware of and need to work our way through. We don't always know the way ahead, but we do know that the th Third Age movement, three a U3As, are agile, and we know how to learn, laugh, and live together. And I wish us all bon voyage. And now I'd like to hand over to Michaela, who is well known to folk and is our new vice chair. And over to you, Michaela. This is good afternoon, everyone. I was lost sight of the time for my. Well, as you know, I've been around quite a while in the movement, having joined in 2003, um, and then I became an East Midlands trustee in 2015, sorry, 2012, and um, helped set up quite a lot of new U3As, which for many of my colleagues is one of the most exciting things about being, in the, being a trustee and bringing new life into the movement. Um, so... Um, I've just been elected as, for the second term, and um, as with all of you, um, I've got a bit older. Um, so, but my three grandchildren are constantly challenging my knowledge and bringing me up to date on things they think I should know. But so, in line with what they're helping me with, I, I'm, I'm making my main contribution to active positive ageing by keeping up with them on very strenuous walks. So hopefully that will carry on for a few years yet. <clears throat> now, I've always enjoyed being at the sharp end of technology, and I've been thrilled to see how you, the, the members, were able to continue your U3A activities during the pandemic by embracing technology like Zoom and Skype. Many U3A set up technical support groups to enable you to, do, to use these new tools and to um, keep your activities going virtually. But it also gave those of you who found it difficult to get to monthly meetings and to interest groups an opportunity to play an active part in the movement. And most importantly, many of you were able to increase your digital skills. The future world is going to be more digital. It's going to include a lot of digital. And you're all going to be well placed to cope with this, um, including your U3A activities. But I want to say what others have said already this morning. Rest assured, we will never become a digital-only movement, and face-to-face -face meetings will never be discarded. So um, I can hear you saying, well, what, what are you going to do as vice chair? Um, and it's our 40th anniversary next year, and I have actually been... Uh, Ian remember my saying to him, you know, we've got to do something for our 40th anniversary because it's a big opportunity. And the, 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 so the thing is that a, a lot of people said, I hope you're not going to go back and tell us what we've all done for the last 40 years. So I said, no, it's not going to be about that. We're, we, we're happy with what we've done. And we want now to show people that we know what we're going to try and do in the future. And I think the thrust of the, 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 proje the project for um, the 40th anniversary is to ensure that everybody takes, takes part because the themes are going to be positive ageing, but concentrating on diversity and inclusion and the future. And this is where we have to, this is where we have to con to contribute. And the 40th anniversary gives us a fantastic opportunity. Um, I think I've, when I look back, we've tried to increase diversity and inclusion over the years, but I think it was, it was more lip service than anything else because we never really tackled it head on and did something. Well, that's going to change. The time is really ripe now for us to actually make sure that U3A, U3As are representative of their communities. So, uh, and we should, let, we should show them that we mean business. I've got some questions for you. Do you want to make a difference? 
U3A is for everyone, and I think that's the best way of describing it. Um, it's again, as has been said, and one of our earliest catchphrases was by the members, for the members. We've been looking at ideas to, to come up with for themes for the, for the 40th anniversary, and one of the ones that's come up is retired and inspired, and we quite, we quite like that. But I'm looking for your ideas, because it's going to be important that you let us know. We want a diverse range of ideas, and we'll try and bring them together and make the 40th anniversary a very positive year. I think it's going to mean we need to take a total look at everything we do and how we do it because it's a big deal. It's a big, it's a big challenge to enable people to feel totally included. So what are we hoping to get out of the um, anniversary? What are we hoping that will happen? We've got the four staples, the raise the profile of the movement, but I think in that we want to incre increase the diversity of our members. And then, of course, promoting learning, showcasing the ways which you proved you can do um, to, about belonging to a, a U3A, which has a positive impact on members' lives. And that, quite a bit's come out of that in the last 12 months. And, of course, demonstrating the benefits of positive ageing. So we're going to have four national projects um, my, my idea is that just like U3A Day, U3As will celebrate the anniversary in the way that appeals most to them, where they feel they can make their impact. Um, so we feel it's a, national, it's a national movement that's reaching its 40th anniversary. So we've got four, four, four main plans for national type events, a round table discussion, which is going to be a recorded uh, discussion with a range of people, including Eric Midwinter, who is our remaining founding father. Pe um, people who are, <coughs> uh, uh, the Isle of Arran, who's one of our very new U3As to see what their vision is for the future. And then we'll gather in a few people to augment this and it'll probably turn into a bit of a question time, which we quite, quite, I think quite interesting. We've, you've already heard about the quilt competition which we launched, and you've heard re reference today to the um, High Street project. I was overwhelmed by the interest this generated. It's been very, very exciting. And we've now got an interactive database where we're putting all the results of the surveys. And, th and this, this time next year, I hope you'll all have had a chance to, to have a go at look, uh, playing with the interactive database. And we've got it for 10 years, so there's room to add more things to it, but U3As keep adding to it. I'm glad that, sorry, I've got to, sorry, can I get my... Yeah, we're running a bit short of time. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just winding up. So, say, um, I'm going to invite people to um, tell me whether they would like to attend a conference again next year, because it's something which was very, very popular, <clears throat> and we'll be doing that through the national newsletter. So, um, I'll be... The project, the, sorry, the anniversary project is going to be my main project for next year, and I'll be playing an active role in promoting U3A's anniversary. So please volunteer. Encourage your U3A's to deliver some fantastic local events in 2022. Don't lose sight of the very real benefits that learning can bring to you in later life, and follow our strap word, learn, laugh, and live, and make sure you have fun. Do you, want to, do you want to introduce Rich, uh, Derek? Yes. Now, could I introduce to you your new treasurer, Derek? Thanks, Michaela. Um, <clears throat> so I was asked to say a few words uh, about myself. 
Um, some of you may have picked up through my uh, nomination for the board position of treasurer um, the details, but in case you haven't, uh, here's a few things uh, about me. So I, I started, um, I joined my local U, uh, U3A, Islington in, in London, about seven years ago uh, as, a, as a humble member. In fact, I only joined really to go to their monthly meetings. Uh, but then I realised that they did things called interest groups, so I started to sort of join those, and then one thing led to another, and the next I was uh, leading and coordinating a few of those groups, and things progressed further, and uh, U3A, as you know, is all about learning new skills, so suddenly uh, I learned about being a webmaster, and um, new, that was certainly a, a new revelation for me about uh, how web designs worked. Uh, and still further, uh, I somehow managed to end up as uh, chair of uh, Islington U3A. So uh, I appreciated at that time all the benefits of being local uh, and then the socialising and the, the contact of a, of a local U3A. But I then suddenly realised there's something about regions within the U3A movement as well. And that led me to start to uh, find out and take part as, uh, you know, within the London region and, and their network activities. Uh, and also then particularly the aspect of helping each other. So uh, you realising that all the U3As, you know, we're in, it, we're in it together, we're doing some of the same things, particularly as committee uh, members, sharing some of the same problems. So through a region, we could actually help each other and support each other rather than trying to uh, uh, reinvent the wheel. Um, and again, progression there, I've ended up as the vice chair within London region. Uh, and that in itself led me on to realise, well, London isn't an island, there are other regions out there. And with Hillary on Network Link, started to realise that again, some of these issues that were bubbling up within the region were also applicable across uh, the other regions as well. So that broadened my horizons uh, even further. Um, And I guess basically that's, uh, that's uh, to sum up, uh, I now feel I know the organisation. I've sort of learnt from the, the bottom up and that's what led me to put in my, uh, throw my hat into the ring to uh, become a board member. Um, one thing you'll have noticed through that description though is I'm not an accountant. So uh, str strangely maybe in terms of, well, why are you being the treasurer? Well, I'm not an accountant by background, but uh, I, I probably am a bit of a data freak almost and quite enjoy an Excel spreadsheet, weirdly. <laughs> so, um, and uh, uh, thanks again specifically to Richard and uh, our handover. So I'm picking up rapidly all things to do with uh, the accounts. I can't promise to uh, maybe carry on with the humour of Richard as I present the accounts next year, but I do look forward to uh, supporting the Third Aid Trust and supporting you. Thank you. So that's the end of the meeting. Lunch is served. I think it's been served in the um, bar area, is that correct? In the Grange. So see you all in the Grange. Thank you very much indeed.